What's up guys, welcome to my official review of the Rafa Origin Racket. One thing really hyped up about this racket is the swing weight. Tennis Warehouse posted that it has a swing weight of 371. So honestly, when I was hitting with this racket, I felt like it was surprisingly maneuverable for a number so high, so high. So I was a little bit suspicious. Maybe mine came in under spec and sure enough it did. I measured it with the graffiti swing weight tool that I have now and it came out to about 350, which is still really high. That's about 20 points over what a pro step autograph is, which is already way too high for a lot of people. So you can imagine what 350 would feel like and you can imagine maybe even then what 370 might feel like. So I was waiting to make this video until I actually went to the shop and measured the swing weight of a few more samples of this same racket just to see if mine is under spec or if the numbers that Tennis Warehouse posted were over spec. And I'm starting to think the latter is actually more true because Tennis Warehouse only took a sample size from two rackets. That's pretty small. I took a sample of mine and then three others. And I believe the numbers that I found were as follows. So my racket strung with 16 gauge Hyper G comes out to about 350 with no dampener. Strings generally add about 25, maybe 30 units of swing weight. So the measurements I did at courtside were from unstrung rackets. All right, so for all these numbers, you can pretty much add 25 or 30, depending on what strings you might put in there. But the unstrung swing weight of the first one was 323. That would come out to about the same as this one if you add 30 units on top of that. The second one came out to 319. Again, very close, a little bit lower maybe. These are only within a few points of each other, right? And the third one that I measured came out to 313. Now that's basically a difference of 10 swing weight units less than the first one that I measured. So everything that I measured from the sample that I picked from, which was four different rackets, including this one, right? Those strung would all be about 340-ish to 350 something. And again, this racket's being strung with a 16 gauge Hyper G. So 16 gauge is a thick string gauge. If anything, I think most people are probably gonna be using a 17 gauge string. Some people might be using multi-filaments, which are lighter. I think it's very realistic to say that the swing weight for most people getting this racket is going to be somewhere in the high 340s to the low 350s. And I honestly feel like it was a little bit careless of Tennis Warehouse to post the swing weight after only measuring two rackets. But they give you that disclaimer if you go to that page that actually posts those specs on that racket. You'll see it in red text as a disclaimer. We only sample two rackets. But you guys are Tennis Warehouse. Don't you guys, don't you guys have access to like the most rackets, like more than anybody else? I'm surprised that you guys only measured two. So my point is that yes, the swing weight is ridiculous and unmanageably high for most people. I don't think the point of this racket is to be something that you would necessarily switch to. I think really the marketing value of this racket is for people that are fans of Rafa, that want somewhat of a collector's racket, or you just want a taste of what Rafa's racket might actually be like to play with. And so for those reasons, I think people might be getting this racket, but a swing weight of 350 is definitely not for most people. And if I had to guess, I think a lot of people on the tour aren't using a swing weight quite that high either. Racket weights over the last several years have definitely gone down in weight a little bit, kind of for everybody, just because the game has become a little bit more top spin and baseline heavy. A lot of people's swing styles are very whippy and racket technology has improved a lot. You can get a lot of power from the strings, but also the stiffness and the way the racket's flex. I think back in the day when rackets were kind of noodly and everything was very low flex, the weight was really important for the power. And it still is for power and stability. I'm just saying that things over the last several years have gotten a little bit lighter. So I can't say for sure, but I'm pretty confident that there are a lot of tour players that are playing with rackets that are below the 350 swing weight. But I'd also imagine that most of them are playing with swing weights over 330 which is still a lot higher than most players are using that are not on the tour. So yeah, that gives you guys a little bit of context on what swing weight should be played at what level. But again, it's all kind of play style dependent at the end of the day. I hope that makes sense. I don't want to get too into it, but maybe I already did. So what else can I say about the racket besides the ridiculous swing weight numbers? I was actually able to play pretty confidently, comfortably, despite that this number is 350. Maybe that makes me feel a little bit less intimidated by those bigger numbers. I wasn't hitting with it for hours and hours. You know, if I'm stuck in a match and I'm playing two or three sets, no doubt that this would tire out my arm more than a lighter racket would. But it might not be a huge difference. The rackets that I generally settle on after I do all my customizations, they float around the mid 330 swing weight. So bumping that up 10 to 15 points, it's not a huge difference. My game doesn't just suffer because of that difference in swing weight. So we'll talk about this racket more, but let's take this review somewhere inside where it's less windy.
If I ever set up a camera outside, it's always a bad idea. If it's quiet out here, it means that it will be loud later. Is this just living in America? Like people are always building stuff constantly? I'm just never gonna get a video outside, ever. All right, guys, I said I was gonna do this inside, but uh, it's still nice outside, but there are sounds. There are always sounds. So uh, I'm gonna try to get through this and maybe we can just be mutually annoyed. <laughs> if other people can be loud, I should be allowed to be loud. So maybe I'll just start yelling when I start hearing noises. Sometimes I just wanna to move to the forest or the mountains. To continue this review, let's keep talking about what makes this racket interesting or different. Well, on the note of it being the origin racket, the intention is to sell a racket that is really close to his actual racket. And I believe that the whole Pure Arrow line of rackets was actually created for him, essentially. So it goes all the way back to the first generation of Pure Arrows. And I think at that time, I should probably fact check myself before I say this, but I think it was called Pure Arrow Soft Drive or something like that. Anyway, if I'm wrong, it's your time to shine in the comments and call me out. But moving on, one thing that is somewhat common with the Pro Stock rackets or pro rackets if you will is a lack of dampening material put inside of the layup of the racket mold and this racket advertises that this racket is proud or embraces the fact that there is no vibration dampening material and the idea is to maximize feel and connectivity with the ball generally for the consumer market they put some kind of dampening mesh or material in there i feel like every company has their own trademarked version but the idea is to reduce the harsh vibrations. So honestly, I'm kind of attracted to the idea of a racket having less of that as opposed to more of that. I think if you're hitting with reasonably comfortable strings, even polyester, let's just say something 17 gauge and you have pretty good technique and your racket is a reasonable weight, like it's heavy enough to actually go through the ball, I feel like you're less likely to have arm problems. And since this racket is really marketed as being as close to the real thing as possible, I was actually hoping that this racket's quality control would be a little bit tighter, partly because of that extra price tag. I know that some of that is just going to the fact that it's a Rafa origin racket, right? There's some money involved just because it's maybe a limited run or whatever. You know, there's a lot of reasons that this racket might be sought after, but I measure a handful of these rackets and the swing weight varies a decent amount and even just comparing it to what tennis warehouse measured when they're getting numbers in the 370s and i'm getting numbers that would imply mid 340s and 350s which swing weight actually represents the racket that he uses so i think it's fair to say that this racket probably gets a lot closer to his actual racket but i don't quite know in what ways and i don't know if 370 or if 350 is closer to his actual spec i don't know if the weight should be more in the twist weight or not like i don't know if it's supposed to be more stable or if it's actually supposed to be kind of floppy i mean this racket overall it has a really high swing weight but when you have a swing weight that varies that much you got to wonder where is the weight varying is there more weight up here in some rackets and more weight over here in some rackets? Or is it just down here and there's not so much up here? Like when the numbers vary that much, you just don't know until you get a tool that can actually measure swing weight and you put that into perspective by measuring the balance of the racket and the twist weight of the racket. That's really the only way to know. And even then it's such a technical process. So no, I don't actually expect Babolat to be able to sell an affordable retail racket that would actually match his specs, that would require so many hours of such tech technical labor on the manufacturing end. I mean, so many extra hours go into just making two rackets match at the factory level. Tennis Spin did a video that revealed some of the specs of an actual Rafa racket, but that was a racket from some time ago. I don't know if it really represents what his current racket setup is. But between that and what we're now seeing available on the consumer market, I think you can get reasonably close. But I kind of feel like if Rafa was to use this racket, he'd be very quick to say, no, that feels nothing like my racket. So is this really an accurate replica or representation of his true tennis racket, I don't know. All I can say is that it's probably closer than the standard pure arrows that we've been seeing for so many generations. And it has a much higher swing weight and no vibration dampening material. I would hope that at least the drill pattern is the same. Every generation of pure arrows and so on, they kind of change the spacing of the strings. So I wonder if this Rafa Origin is actually the same kind of drill pattern that he has on his actual racket. That's gonna be super hard to get a side by side of. Anyway, let's talk a little bit more about the racket and how it actually plays. So on a final note regarding that vibration dampening material, the lack of it in this racket, I do feel some more of that sort of tingly sensation that I was talking about. I think the sensation of where the ball might have hit 
in the string bed, those vibrations, they last a little bit longer. I don't actually feel like this is that harsh of a racket, despite the fact that it's pretty stiff. It is really heavy, so with good technique, it goes through the ball pretty well. And I think I do notice feeling a little bit more connected to the ball, but it's not like some crazy night and day difference where it's like, wow, I really need this on every racket. I've definitely had better sensations of touch or feel from other rackets than this one. But as far as pure arrows go, is it the one where I feel the most connected to the ball? I'm not sure. I don't think I've had enough time with it to really say. I haven't tested it with enough different strings and tensions to say that. I think it's one of those things that's a really subtle difference, but I'm sure there is a difference and I'm sure some people would notice it. So I'm going to go out on a limb here and actually guess that Tennis Warehouse, somewhere in the near future, they do this sometimes, but I'm going to guess that they will actually update that swing weight claim and lower whatever they think the official average is. Just a guess. But that being said, how playable is a 350-ish swing weight? Well, it's kind of hard to say. Swing weight isn't so easy to put into perspective unless you also consider things like balance. And I'm actually surprised that this racket has such a high swing weight rating despite its balance and weight. So it's really interesting how numbers like that can vary so much. So who is this racket really for? I'm not really sure. The thing about pro player rackets is that every single pro player's racket is probably extremely different from the next guy. I mean, I don't think Djokovic's racket is anything like Federer's racket, and I don't think Federer's racket is anything like Nadal's racket. And you can just keep listing pro players out there. You might find some that have a couple of rackets in common, like the H19 and the H22 are a common pro stock mold that a lot of the tour players use. But a lot of tour players actually just use a retail racket from an earlier time because they turned pro maybe 10 years ago and they're still using that racket that they turned pro with 10 years ago, but they keep getting that racket made for them. So their pro stock racket is actually just whatever the retail racket was for them 10 years ago. That's very often the case. When I initially heard about pro stock rackets, I thought it was like, oh, now that you're a pro, we're actually gonna give you this secret inventory that is way better than anything offered on the retail market. That's not necessarily the case. The difference between a pro racket and a retail racket is generally that more quality control steps are taken, but generally a pro stock racket is just inventory or a mold that isn't retail anymore and maybe offers some quirks like it's actually manufactured to 27.2 inches or something like that. There's a lot of head pro stocks that they actually, I think, manufacture at 28 inches and then you can cut it down to what you want. There's no weight added, so it's actually, it's called a hairpin. It's basically as light as possible. They don't even put the grip mold on there. If you really want to, you can find rackets like that. And sometimes they're made in different factories. So I'm not trying to be a buzzkill here, but if you're going out there and you're getting the racket that you think is actually an exact replica of Rafa's racket, I don't really think it's safe to say that it is. Again, even if everything about it is, the fact that I am measuring the swing weight and getting relatively different readings that just means that some of them are close and some of them maybe aren't. And who knows how that's affecting things like the balance or the twist weight or the swing weight. I mean, these are really nitpicky details, but I'm sure somebody like Rafa has all those details down to a T on all of his rackets. So I don't think that these rackets have that precision element down quite like that. And with how much each of these specs vary, I have no idea which one of those most closely represents his. So it's actually hard for me to say who this racket is for. I think at best it's a collector's item, and maybe after that it's a way to get closer to what his actual racket is. I think the last person that this racket is actually for is someone looking for a new racket. As I was saying, all these different tour players, they are so specific about what they are looking for in a racket. And my point is that everything about their racket is so personal. It's not like they're a pro and now every pro wants this same thing out of a racket. No, each one of them wants something vastly different from the next pro because their set of strengths and weaknesses are so developed that they really want their racket to cater to exactly the type of player that they are. And anything that's a little bit off of that might be holding them back and mean the difference between winning or losing a set or a point or whatever, all those little things add up. So is this racket even closer really to a tour level racket? I think the only thing about it that is, is maybe the swing weight. But if that's really the only meaningful difference, then you can just add a bunch of lead tape to your racket and you'd be playing with pro level specs. And like I said, a lot of the rackets that are being used on the tour by the professionals are actually retail rackets. Some of them current, some of them older, some of them are a pro stock inventory. So not all of them have that vibration dampening mesh, but some of them do. And some of them have versions of that that were marketed in the past. 
like there's probably tour players that were using that commonly hated countervail technology on the Wilsons. So if you want to get a racket that is probably the closest to his actual racket, then sure, this is probably the best one to get that, or you can get your hands on whatever that first generation of pure arrows was. But that was the retail one. I'm not really sure if his was close to what the retail version of that racket was. So yeah, if you just want a taste of that and you think it gets pretty close, maybe this racket is for you. But hey, I was actually surprised to see how well I could play with a 350 swing weight. Now going into it, I thought it was gonna be closer to 370. So I'm like, wow, this is really light for 370. But turns out that it's 350, but 350 is absolutely no joke. And I think if you're at least like a four five level player, you could probably play good tennis with this. Maybe even a four. Honestly, it's hard to say what levels would and wouldn't. Talking about levels and what levels apply to the racket and the specs is tricky. So yeah, I guess go ahead and forget all that stuff I said about levels. I mean, this racket is already in a territory that's so out of most people's specs anyway. It's mostly for people that just want to get closer to the real thing and have a collector's item. But it is a legitimate racket. You can play tennis with it and you might have fun. You might have fun hitting with a racket that is this heavy. And for me, it's actually done a little bit for my confidence. Just hitting as well as I did with this, it made me feel like, well, Maybe I can get closer to those numbers and still play the type of tennis that I want to play. If you guys are interested in this racket, you guys can purchase one of these from the tennis shop that I'm affiliated with, Courtside Tennis. I'll give you guys a link that gives me a small commission on the purchase and no extra cost to you. And if you guys want to try my favorite strings, be sure to check out Restring Zero. Crazy snapback, durability, and tension maintenance. I know everybody cares about that stuff. That string has it in spades. So check it out. Link below will get you 10% off. It's my favorite string. And yeah, I guess that completes my review for the Pure Era Rafa. It's getting a little bit dark out here, so I might as well call it. <laughs> But yeah, I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you, and be sure to subscribe and like. I will see you in the next video. Take care. Bye. Hello. It's a new day, so I guess this is going to be the surprise at the end of the video. I forgot to say this, but I just wanted to say this racket reminds me so much of like a rainbow sorbet ice cream. Does anyone else feel that? Just looks like cotton candy, bubble gum, sorbet. Just has like those silly ice cream summer vibes. I kind of like the color though. Honestly, when my buddy was hitting with it from across the court from me, I was like, that's pretty, it's looking good. So maybe that wasn't a surprise, but I wanted to say that I forgot to. Really important stuff, right? <laughs> Maybe I need to get a selfie stick, okay. The other thing is I'm deciding to mess around with the V-Core Pro 100. Maybe you guys know that my opinion on the V-Core Pro series in general was that all those rackets felt a little bit too mushy. And I never tried the 100 because the string pattern was the most open of them. But besides that, I just felt like the whole thing the whole series just feels too mushy anyway, so I never really gave it a fair shot. Now you guys know I really care about string density or string spacing density, but I gotta be honest, Restring Zero is so strong, so durable, that I think I can afford to open up the string bed a little bit and still have insane durability. The other racket I'm deciding to mess around with again is the V-Core 98, because in my review video, which you can watch if you haven't, I'm hitting it Indian Wells, it's a pretty cool video. I played with this racket in stock form in the video, but I really didn't feel like it has that whip and there's just other things about it. I just didn't feel like it's not, it's not getting the spin that I'm able to get, even with the V-Core Pro 100, I can get better spin with the V-Core Pro 100, which is ridiculous, right? But I gotta try this racket with my my setup now. I have my strings kind of figured out. I'm going to string it a little bit lower than my demo probably came and I'm going to give it my customization. So we'll see. I think there's actually a shot that I could really like this racket. I'm sure that I can at least like it more than I did in that video. So we'll see. This will be take two. I'm going to put restring zero in here. I put a leather base grip on and it does make a difference. It's a little more headlight now and I like that. And yeah, those are my surprises. I guess they're just some <laughs> announcements for content to come up. So yeah, if you're watching until the end of this video, you are among the first to find out. So that's cool. All right, I'll see you guys in a future video. Be sure to like and subscribe and check out the links in the description to get a discount on zero, which is my favorite string, nasty top spin. Ooh, I do this in a lot of videos. Let's see if I can do it with a selfie video. <laughs> this is gonna be hard. I like to show off the snapback. Well, that's hard, how am I gonna hold the racket? Anyway, look at this snapback. You see how good this is? See that? Just snaps back into place. Look at that, all the strings just snap back into place. Now this is a fresh string job, but even towards the end of the lifespan on zero, you can expect that kind of snapback, it's crazy. So check out the link in the description to get 10% off. And if you wanna buy that string again, cause you like it so much, I think you might. You can use my link again for 10% off again. Get 17 gauge, string it a couple pounds lower than you might your typical poly. Tension maintenance is super good, so you don't really need to go up in tension to calibrate for tension drop. So just string it a couple pounds lower than you would your typical poly. All right, I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you for sticking around to the end of the video, but don't forget to subscribe if you haven't. All right, catch you later.